All right, so we're up to uh, Acts 16. Now, if you remember last week, last week there was that split between um, Barnabas and Paul. And this is Paul now going with Silas. All right? And he goes with Silas, and he goes throughout these areas to the churches to, to strengthen them. Um, he also goes with the decision of what uh, the Jerusalem Council came up with. Um, because these churches, remember, they, they didn't know what was going on at the time. So they were going also to go visit them, see how they're doing in their faith, but also to let them know about the decision made there. Now, they meet this guy named Timothy there, who is a uh, disciple as well, He's spoken of highly in that area. And he, takes, he wants to take him with him on the mission. He gets him circumcised, and then they go and they grow. The church there as well is strengthened, and they grow. Now, they hit some roadblocks as they're going through the areas, and the Spirit, Jesus says, no, do not preach here. You cannot preach the word in these areas. So they kept on going. Now, they get to a city in Troas, which is on the coast, and from there he gets a vision uh, from a Macedonian man pleading with him to cross over the seas and go help him. Now, Macedonia is on the other side, as Aleki was explaining. It's on the other side of the sea. Um, we'll also see how it works with us today. Now, point one uh, is the same divisions, which is verses one to five. Uh, I've got it up there. If it's too small to read, please pull out your Bibles and, and read along. Um, it's verses one to five. Can we read together, please? Paul went on to Derby and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Lyconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So again, point one is the gospel grows and strengthens the church spiritually, while God adds to it numerically. Again, the explanation is there. I've got a... Um, a map there, so you guys can see. So the green highlighted map, that is where they are. So they went from Syria, Antioch, and they go to the green area, and this is where they're talking about now. They meet Timothy there in Derby, and the church is strengthened spiritually and numerically. Now we can see two, two things here, all right? We can see two growths here. We can see that the church grows spiritually, but also its growth is numerically as well. We also see that Timothy is added to Paul's mission, and they both use the gospel to strengthen the church. Now, how are we growing spiritually? Are we growing spiritually? Are we even growing spiritually? I mean, I don't have to mention too much about it, but Martha was up here talking about it. We have people that may be sitting here as well that's not growing spiritually. The minute they leave, they try and destroy the church. They talk bad, spread lies. How are we growing spiritually? Is there any fruit in our lives? You know, when we come to Sundays, when we come to church, do we just come here because it's a Sunday? Is it part of our routine on a Sunday to come to church? Do we come here and we want to hear so we can grow, be fed the spiritual word from God so we can grow in our lives? Or is it to us just words, just words? It's just someone speaking from the front, just saying all these words. It means nothing. But that's not true. That's not true. We know the words spoken up here when we read the Bible. They are God's words, and they are the gospel that can save us. And that's what 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2 tells us. But if we're waiting to grow numerically before we grow spiritually... Like in, in the rest of Acts, God adds thousands into his church. Everywhere he goes, thousands, thousands. Is, are we, is that what we're waiting for before we grow spiritually? Till we grow to, to the thousands? We are part of a church that is massive in heaven. Thousands, thousands. But we should be growing spiritually as well. You know, sometimes when the church doesn't grow, that can be 
almost unbelief. We can almost let it set in here that we're not growing as a church. So we start unbelieving. That's a, not a good thing to have. We should get rid of that. We should ask God, God, please, remove the unbelief. Remove the unbelief that's in my heart. Right? Let's grow spiritually, but also God will just grow his church numerically. I've got Psalms uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5 there. Now, it's all highlighted on what I was trying to explain to you. Happy, right, is the one that grows spiritually. Happy is the one who walks, who does not walk in the advice of the wicked. Doesn't stand in the pathway of sinners or sit with mockers. Right? Instead, his delight is in the Lord's word, the Lord's instruction. He meditates on it. Right? He's like a tree planted besides a flowing stream. Whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked, though, are not like this. Instead, they're like chaff. Now, chaff is very light, all right? The wind can just blow it. The lightest, lightest wind can just blow it away. The wicked will not stand up in judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly or the righteous. So there's two ways you can grow here. You can either grow spiritually towards God, or you can go the opposite, against God. I pray that that's not us, that we go against God. I pray that we are a church that grows spiritually towards God rather than the opposite. Whatever it is, whatever it is that's holding you back, let it go. Pray to God. Ask him to continue to grow his church, but also us as his church, spiritually towards him rather than the opposite way with Satan, who always comes to try and destroy everything. All right, second point is... Verses 6 to 8, and that is the church must pray. God doesn't harden our hearts towards the gospel. Uh, if we can see that, can we please read together? They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I've got another map there. I like maps today. So I've got another map. And see those areas, those highlighted areas, they're the areas that the gospel wasn't, they weren't allowed to preach in. Now that's around modern day Turkey now today, Turkey. Um, those areas, Paul was going through. Jesus said, no, do not preach the word here. And what happened? They kept on going. All right. And Troas there is, is the little, little one on the far, your far right. That's where, it, uh, far left, I mean, that is that little city. Now, when you travel, think of it as this. If our hearts are hardened, that's what the gospel looks like. We just swing right past us. We don't, we don't even, we won't even know what the gospel is because we've, God has hardened our hearts. We must ask God not to harden our hearts. If you remember the story with Pharaoh, God hardened his hearts. He did so many signs and wonders, so many. Pharaoh still hardened his heart. And it wasn't even Pharaoh. It was God that hardened his heart. Why? He set him apart for destruction. I pray that's not us, that we are these highlighted areas where the gospel just swing past us. Because that means we're set apart for destruction. The gospel and God is our salvation. Let's no more, no longer the heart in our hearts. We plead to God, pray to him. He is the one that does harden and unharden our hearts. If our hearts are hardened, how do we know? Well, we'll know just basically by the things we do with the church, right? Lotu Hufia. How hard is it to get everyone to come to Lotu Hufia? It's very hard. I would plead here day, every week up here, join Lotu Hufia. What about Glacier Aho? For me personally, it's sometimes very hard to get them to Glacier Aho, but I praise the Lord that they still join. What about when we do a congregation prayer at the end? If you know, if you open your eyes, you'll see so many people stand up and walk outside. Many of the young ones, but also some of the men. They'll just get up outside the gate. Wouldn't want to stand in here and pray with us 
so that God can unharden our hearts. Right? That's what we don't want. And that's why I pray that that's not us, that the gospel doesn't come in here. We need the gospel. We need it so desperately in this world today where there's everyone, everyone is talking about the gospel and they're twisting it, different things, different things. How do you know what's the truth? You've got to know your word. But if your heart is being hardened by God, how? Ask God to unharden your hearts so that you'll be able to submit to him. Maybe that's why we don't. God hardens our hearts. We just don't want to submit to him. We don't want to come and worship with his people. We don't want to gather together with his people. Even tithing, even that's a hard thing to do. I hope that is not our church. Now, I've got Hebrews there, Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 8. Can we read this together, please? Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today. Ask him today. All right, don't wait till tonight. Don't wait till night time. Don't wait till tomorrow. When we pray as a church, ask the church, please do not harden my heart. Don't harden my heart. I don't want to be hardened to the gospel. I don't want to perish. You know, the gospel swings straight past us. You know what comes next? God's wrath. We don't, we don't want that. All right? But when we pray today, if we remember this, Psalms 51, verses 10 to 12, we ask him for this. Let's read together, please. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of salvation to me and sustain me to give me a willing spirit. It's the word of the Lord. Sorry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so that's, that's what we ask God, all right? If our hearts are hardened, let's ask God, please renew it. Don't let the gospel swing past us because what comes next is something we don't want. Last point is from verses 9 to 10. And that is God calls us to preach the gospel to those God chooses. Can we read together, please? During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, again, another map. Another map there. So that area there, Aleki kind of explained it at the end. That's Macedonia, all right? That's where Philip Pie is, Thessalonica. Now, these guys are pleading for the, help, for the gospel help. But we'll also know what happens to him in Thessalonica and how people there were hardened. Um, but yes, as soon as he got the vision, immediately they made efforts to go. They made efforts to go, and they realized God called them to preach the word there. Now, we see here as well that there are others that aren't hardened to God's word or God's gospel, and he calls people to help them, right? If you remember Acts 10, Acts 10, Cornelius' house, right? He pleaded with God, he prayed. He, he was, a, he, he was a, a devout man, prayed, but he wasn't saved yet. God sent, told him, sent him in a vision, an angel, told him, go and call Peter, he'll come and give you the message where you and your household will be saved. The same here with the Macedonian man, right? The gospel is the salvation. Jesus Christ is the saviour. They need the help. They need the help. So he wants to go there and he believes and he concluded that it is God that tells him to go there. Now, when we plead to God, we plead the same way, like I mentioned earlier, with our lot to We plead with him with our prayer points. We ask him for help. We plead with him as well with our 12 p.m. prayers, our 6 p.m. prayers, also our family prayers. We plead with God for the things that we pray for, that they also be saved uh, by God. See, but the problem is, there's a problem that when we, we want God, this Christian problem today is we want God and everything he gives us, the blessings, everything, and we still want to live in the world. 
We want him to give us money. We want him to give us all these things. But we still want to be worldly, do our own things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Can we read this, please? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possession is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Look, you can't have both. All right? You can't have the world. You can't have God. You've got to pick one. Pick one. Again, the world is full of these things. I'm not going to mention they're already up there. All right? And that's what some churches are today. You know, in possessions, they're, they're rich in possessions, but dead when it comes to God's word. They have everything, but they're dead spiritually. God's probably hard in their hearts. Huh? So when you, when you see someone pleading, when, you look, when I look here, I look at everyone's faces, I see he's pleading for help, the gospel. But I also know that it's not me up here that changes your hearts. It is God. And I can see you guys pleading, and I'm pleading with you guys, the same way that everyone else is pleading to God, that he doesn't harden our hearts, right? That we are saved, but also that we must proclaim his word. Same in our families. Do we proclaim the word in our families? Do you see them? Do you see your children pleading with you? Tell me the gospel because you know it. Or are you too busy pleading with your boss because you want overtime for more money? Which one is it? The world or God? All right, we've got to decide. Do not let the gospel swing past us. Pray to God that it doesn't harden our hearts. You must grow spiritually. Don't worry about the numerical growth. Because God is the one that's been adding to his church. I've got some prayer points up here. Uh, if we can pray together.